I'd say wait for people to find this place, but it looks like everyone's already found it, and then some. So uh, I'm just going to kick off here. Um, my name is Micah Godbolt. Um, that's all my info here. Um, so I want to say if you want to follow me on Twitter, uh, Micah Godbolt, I will make sure to tweet out um, not only the slides for this later on, uh, but also um, I've got some demo code that I'm kind of moved around, uh, so I need to create a new repo for it. But I certainly want to make sure that's available for you as well. So that's a little carrot to follow me, because I'll be tweeting that information out so you can get a handle on it. Um, a couple other things about me. I'm a front-end developer at Lolabot. I've been there for about the last year or so, uh, and it's awesome. I love Lolabot. I just had to say that, and contractually obligated to say that, so I said it. Are we done? Good. All right. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Lolabot.com slash jobs. Yes, we are hiring. All right. <laughs> Triple I is capital D, capital A. Anyway. Uh, <laughs> so a couple of things about me. Uh, I'm from Portland, Oregon, um, out in the States. Um, this is my second DrupalCon. Obviously, my first one was when it was in Portland this last year, which was quite nice. Um, but my first time speaking, so um, thank you for, like, <laughs> for crazy stuff in the back and everyone that's wanting to come out here and shove in. There's some more room up front, so if people want to still come on in, um, we'll try and, I don't know, we'll, try, <laughs> we'll, we'll fake it till we make it. A um, couple other things about me. I, um, I am also the uh, creator of a, a series of videos called SAS Bytes, which you can also follow on Twitter at SAS Bytes uh, or YouTube.com um, slash SAS Bytes. If you're interested in front end development and especially SAS, using SAS to uh, really power your front end development, uh, that's what SAS Bytes is all about. It's a weekly, uh, about 10, 20 minute presentation I give on everything from um, directives, um, uh, loop statements, um, mixins functions, all that kind of stuff. So if you're curious, you can check that out. Those are all obviously recorded and put on YouTube. I'm also the founder of PDX SAS, a, um, a SAS meetup that we meet monthly out in Portland. We're up, coming up on our fourth month, so it's kind of nice. Um, those are also recorded and posted live, uh, which is a blast. Um, we actually have two or three people. I think there's someone from, uh, from Italy that watches every uh, week. It's kind of cool. We can just broadcast Italy. So um, we do that every month, second Thursday of the month uh, at 6 p.m. Pacific time. Uh, again, it's recorded, so you can find it. Um, and the next one we're going to do is actually, hey, that's kind of cool. <laughs> is, uh, <laughs> you still see the slides. Uh, the next one we're going to do is a uh, is an actual SAS boot camp, because we've been doing it for a little while, and we want to make sure that all the newcomers will get a chance to um, just kind of get up to speed, and we'll have some hands-on stuff there. So if you're in Portland, please stop by. Or you can check us on uh, at PDX SAS on Twitter, uh, get some links to all of our videos and those kind of things. So. Let's get on to what this talk is actually about, and not me and my little side projects. Um, but hey, the clicker works. Cool. Um, creating responsive Drupal prototypes with Angular JS. It's a nice packed title. Um, the title has two parts. Um, the first part is this: is creating um, responsive Drupal prototypes. Um, so what we're talking about that is actually starting not in Drupal, but actually starting in code, building um, as much of the site as possible um, from uh, prototypes and wireframes all the way into an actual design process before we even get into an actual Drupal install. To do as much of that as possible when code is cheap uh, and when changes are cheap. Because once you get into Drupal, you know that changes are not cheap whatsoever. So that's what the first part is this is going to be about, is explaining why this is necessary. Um, and then secondly, with AngularJS is going to talk about how we can leverage a system like AngularJS to make that possible. So uh, let, let me give you a quick idea of what we're going to be talking about during this entire presentation, what to expect. Um, and the first thing is with creating responsive Drupal prototypes. Uh, this is an approach. Uh, what I'm going to be talking about is not specific to Angular. Um, it's an approach to designing uh, prototypes in the browser for Drupal or really any, any content management system. Um, it is about designing in the browser. So if you're not designing in the browser yet, this is going to be your call to say, it's time to start. It's time to think about it because the tools are actually there, there to make this happen. Uh, thirdly, it's about getting the front-end developers involved in the process much earlier. Uh, I've been on way too many projects where <laughs> the designer is done, it's design signed off, and it's passed off to me as a front-end developer. And, and then it's my job to go like, oh, why did you make those decisions? Why did you do that? And to spend all that time that if I just had a chance to, you know, a little bit earlier in the process to maybe make a small few tweaks, that life would be a lot easier for me. So that's really what this is about, is getting the front-end developer in earlier because there's code instead of Photoshop files, and we can, we can deal with code, right? 
Um, and so the second part with AngularJS, uh, what I do want to say is this is not the only way um, to accomplish what's on the left. AngularJS is just one of the opportunities, one of the possibilities. Uh, when I started this project, I actually started in Jekyll. Um, and then after a little bit of Jekyll, I actually moved to a Ruby gem. And then after that Ruby gem, I moved to Angular. So this has been through three iterations already. And after the Twig presentation I saw yesterday, I'm like, you know, this might eventually move to Twig. Because <laughs> there's a lot of the concepts in Twig uh, that are really similar to what um, I've been doing and creating with Angular. So especially when D8 gets really solid and Twig is there and we kind of know what those final templates are going to be like, um, I'm really hoping to maybe they'll start using Twig for the same, uh, same thing. So again, and we need help for that. And we need help for that. <laughs> So, um, so just to say, Angular is not the only approach to this. Um, the other thing is, this is not an Angular app. This is usually what scares my designers. It's like, I don't know how to write Angular, and I don't want to learn how to write Angular. I'm not asking you to be able to write an Angular app from scratch. What we're doing is, um, actually, let me do this. Uh, so this is not an actual web app. This, is, is, this isn't like a software as a service where you go to a page and you click on things and you get pages to do stuff. That's not what we're trying to do. Uh, we're also not trying to create a full MVC just for a prototype. Really what we're doing is we're using the view layer of, um, of Angular and using Angular as an actual templating system, kind of similar to how you'd be using Twig uh, in Drupal 8. But of course, we're still dealing with Drupal 7, so Angular works really well for that. Um, so along with templating, templating and also the directives that are included in Angular, there's a lot of power that lets us uh, accomplish this. So that's what we're going to be talking about. Uh, there's kind of these two halves. The first one talking about why we need to be doing this. Uh, and then secondly, how we can accomplish this with, uh, with AngularJS and really with any framework, um, any framework that, that supports these concepts. So, um, oh, and also, <laughs> Angular is also the foundation for Tractor. Tractor is uh, a, this project that I'm currently working on that is built with Angular to do this. Um, it was actually originally called Protractor. Then I found out some of these are using Protractor. Protractor is such a great Angular name. I was so mad, but life goes on. So, um, so it was shortened to Tractor. And it just happened that Emma Jane had a huge picture of a tractor in her place. And I was like, there, there's my inspiration. It's based off a picture in, in her living room. All right. So um, this is what a, uh, a page, a built page, would look like when using, um, uh, when using Tractor. As you can see, what you're doing is you're just writing code in the browser, just like you would, would really any like design in the browser, write HTML in the browser, and that gets compiled into a page like that. So on the left-hand side, we have like a page manifest, which describes all of your, describes your layout, describes, describes your blocks, regions, whatever you want to call them, and also the parcels inside. So if, if you saw Fabian's talk yesterday, it's the exact same concept. I was like, he's stealing my stuff. I swear. Um, so you can, you can define your layouts, you can define your, your regions and put content inside of that. Um, it's also the concept of partials. So all of your HTML is broken out into smaller partials that can be re reused over and over again um, and then placed into, into those page manifests. Um, you can also put straight HTML in there as well. It doesn't have to be necessarily a partial. Um, but typically, you want to break everything out as much as you can. Um, so again, this is... Um, uh, a, a quick mock-up I did for a project a little while ago. This is more in like the prototyping phase. Um, once this was done and, and the, cu the customer was happy with this layout, we move in and design using this exact same tool, just applying designs and styles and uh, some kind of design pattern to everything. So this is what we're going to be working with um, uh, in the second half. So I just want to give you a little teaser um, so kind of know what our finished product is going to look like. Um, this is Tractor today. It's small. It's still <laughs> a work in progress. And there's a link as well if you want to take a quick, quick shot of that. It's at our, uh, our Lullabot uh, GitHub account slash Tractor. I'll have the slide at the end as well, so um, don't worry about that. But this is what I'm hoping Tractor is going to be when we're actually finished with it. It's certainly a work in progress. Um, every chance we get to add a little bit of functionality is pretty cool. Um, it just adds another tool that makes uh, the life of a designer and front-end developer um, a lot better. And uh, I was just able to do one... Um, uh, actually, just a couple weeks ago when I was really happy to get in there. I'll demo that in a bit. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a great process. You can continue to refine it, add in functionality, and hopefully we'll get that beast when we're done with it. So before we take a look under the hood of Tractor, and I keep forgetting I have notes here. Cool. All right. Um, what we want to do is take a quick look at why we need to do this. What, what has led us up to this point, uh, and what are the frustrations that we're really trying to meet? And to do that, I want to tell you a story. 
I love telling stories, as everyone here, well, everyone here that knows me can say. Um, I like to talk a lot, so it just seemed like a good fit. I'll tell a story. Um, but just to note that the people in this story are fictitious. They are made up. And so any resemblance to people either living or dead or in the future is completely coincidental. So it, it is taken from personal experience and experience uh, um, that coworkers have had. So um, it's, I'm not making this stuff up, but it certainly not, did not happen in these order of events. So this story, like any other good story, starts in a bar, because that's where all your good stories start, especially in Prague. So um, I was meeting with a designer friend of mine uh, on Friday night, as we, ever, as we do every Friday night, just kind of our Friday night ritual. Um, we just get around and just talk about life, talk about work, talk about whatever. Um, but this time, the designer with a nice, really healthy shot in his hand, would not stop talking about the golden age of web design. Me being a little curious and maybe a little bit too naive, uh, asked him to explain, what, what is this golden age of web design that you're talking about? And he said, well, back in the day, because he's one of those back in the day kind of designers, uh, back in the day, when you want to create a prototype, it was simple. You would just open up the most current version of PowerPoint. And you just start laying out your headers and your footers and your sidebar and your sidebar and your third sidebar. We really love sidebars. Um, and you just lay out your content and the, and the client would go, yep, that's perfect. That's the number of sidebars I want. And you can move on. After you're done with that, you would just open up Photoshop, go 960 pixels by, well, you know, that fold, that magical fold that everyone wants. You hit that point, just perfect. Um, and you, you, you make your design. It's beautiful. It's gorgeous. It's <laughs> I seriously, to find this, I looked up like horrible web designs and just Googled it. And this is what I came up with. Uh, so if you design this, I'm really sorry. Uh, <laughs> so uh, when you're done with this, all you had to do is get signed off by the client pass it to the front-end developer and go to Fiji because your job was done. Yeah, as long as the front-end developer was competent enough to make a website that looked exactly like this by slicing and dicing and doing whatever you need to do, your job was finished. That was it. It was easy. That was the golden age and it was wonderful. But then something happened. I think we all kind of know what happened. It was this guy and it was that thing. That happened. Now everyone's, instead of looking at this, the websites on these big monitor, they're now looking on these tiny little phones. So now I've got to do two different layouts and got to do two different designs. And that's twice as much work. I don't like that. All right, and then this happened. Crap. <laughs> now we've got three of them. I have to do three different designs because they want to know what the tablet's going to look like and the desktop. And they want to know what the phone's going to look like. Well, and then just the, 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 the dam broke and this happened. This is Samsung's current offering. Actually, this is just even a little bit old. Uh, 26 different devices, 16 different screen sizes. Uh, when there's a, a great website out there, uh, I think it's screen sizes dot, like dot yes at the end or something, um, that basically catalogs all the different screen resolutions that are out there. And there are 50 plus different screen resolutions on mobile quote unquote devices. Um, that is a lot of breakpoints, and there's no chance we're going to hit every single one of those with a Photoshop design, with a prototype, or anything like that. So, what in the world am I going to do? And if, so, that was his spiel. Um, and of course, as a front end developer, I've got an easy solution. Start designing the browser, yo. What are you doing? Because everyone knows that a text editor plus a browser is ponies and rainbows. So, that's what you need to do. Obviously, as a friend developer, that's what I say. So, incredibly inspired by my amazing speech. Remember, it was probably just the ponies, but incredibly inspired. He goes off to do exactly that. So, week goes by, and next Friday night, and this guy definitely wants a picture. I'm going to wait for that. <laughs> Um, no, the next Friday night, we made it up for drinks again. I'm expecting, you know, it's going to be a good story. We'll see how this goes. So back to the same place, same time. But there's two drinks on the table now, and his face looks a little concerned. So I ask, how did it go? And um, so he starts off. Well, I started by doing extensive research. And after five minutes, I found this. <laughs> Solved all my problems. I could quickly put together a page with my headers and footers and buttons and rotators and more rotators and more rotators because that's what they want. And life was great. I had my design up and going in no time. But there were some problems. What were those problems I asked? 
again, yeah, at this point I was probably just egging them on. Well, the first thing is the client didn't want to end up on this site. And if you can't read it, it's yet another bootstrap Tumblr log. Um, Tumblr, or bootstrap sites tend to, if you don't put a lot of effort into it, look kind of the same. You got the bar up top that's sticky and the navigation that works just the same and the buttons look kind of the same and it might be different colors, but you have to spend a lot of time really customizing it to get away from that look. Secondly, the front end developer wasn't too happy. He was actually really kind of upset that he had to include a 25K JavaScript file just to get this navigation that the, the, that the uh, client fell in love with. It's like, that's a lot of weight for mobile nav. It's that, or I have to build the whole thing over again. And thirdly, the backend developers got a little annoyed after my 30th pull request to add yet another span something class to a div. This is Drupal. What are you thinking? Don't do that. So the process didn't go too well. In the end of it, no one was really happy and I don't think I'm gonna do that again. So just to, to uh, backtrack a little bit, I, I don't hate on these foundation, bootstrap, those types of things. I'm not a fan of them. I, I know a lot of people use them for prototyping. Um, but if you are just prototyping, um, and this is perfect, Sam is here. He didn't know he was gonna be called out. Um, <laughs> if you're just prototyping, oh, I went too far, there we go. Uh, if you're just prototyping, you need to remember that that prototype is probably gonna disappear. It's probably code that's just gonna be developed for one, one particular purpose and eventually tossed. And you need to be prepared for that, if that is what your plan is. But what I'm trying to propose, and we were trying to do at Lullabot, is we're trying to take this prototyping, we're trying to take the wireframing into prototyping, all the way into the design phase and into the Drupal site. Uh, and so with that in mind, my, my response to him was, yeah, but you need to build it with quality in mind that you might be stuck with that. You might be stuck with that JavaScript. You might be stuck with those classes and, and all of those behaviors. So when you're doing this process, you need to be thinking from the beginning, like, is this the code that I want to inherit when I start building a theme? You know, is this a SAS structure that I want to inherit when building a theme? Is this how I want to apply those styles? Do I need, am I going to have to put span classes on every single div in this entire site just to make this layout work? Think about that stuff when you're building. And that's really why I think that uh, something like Twitter Bootstrap um, Foundation is not the best solution for this. Because it gets you up through prototyping, but it doesn't get you into designing and theming. So my advice to him was skip the, um, uh, skip the uh, Bootstrap or anything like that and just write straight up HTML, CSS, as if you were like with the, with the end goal in mind. So again, extremely inspired but no ponies this time. I, I, I just must be doing better for some reason. He goes off and does it. Um, next Friday comes along. I'm thinking this, is, this will be good. We'll, we'll, we'll see how it goes. Unfortunately, this is his order. So <laughs> after a row of flaming mows, if anyone's seen it, um, I knew it's gonna be an interesting evening. So I asked my designer friend, how did it go? <laughs> I will really wanna hear. So he says, it started out fine. This is his story. Um, I built a page, built a page from scratch, just used a, um, uh, used a grid framework within, within Compass, and that worked out really well. It was very easy. Um, it was about you know, one page, about 50 lines of HTML, about 100 lines of CSS. It was pretty good. I, I liked it. You know, it was nice and clean. I would I'd be happy with this code in production. It works. <laughs> but then, of course, this happened. We don't need just one page. They want around 20 different pages. So 20 pages, about 1,000 lines of HTML, and about 2,000 lines of CSS. That might be a little exaggeration, but math is a lot easier when you just multiply. So just suffice to say, there's a lot of pages. There's a lot of HTML. There's a lot of things to keep track of. Uh, because and after that happened, the, well, the inevitable comes in. Like, the navigation, can you just add one more item and that sidebar block can can you just switch the order with something else and um, add a class to that one thing right there and change request after change request after change request which was multiplied by 20 because all these different pages repeated HTML over and over and over and over again um, this process is so difficult to maintain uh, by the end of it um, I'm trying to remember where we're at oh yeah um, oh, sorry. Then after that, um, I built a mobile navigation. It was great. I spent days on it. I loved it. The client said, mm, 
No, I'll just have a drop nav. Click on it, go to the footer, we're good. <laughs> There's two days lost. All right, then I spent two more days working on some awesome uh, um, tabs, like, you know, all the JavaScript behaviors and all that, just so it works perfectly. And then I remembered, wait a minute, Drupal just gives you that for free, doesn't it? Why am I spending days on this? And seriously, these are things that have happened. Um, so the amount of time that was put into this project just to make some of these simple things happen, um, it became unmanageable, unmaintainable. And seriously, in, in the case where this happened, uh, for me as a front end developer, I pretty much looked at the mocks and went, okay, that's nice, I'll build it again. So in this case too, um, it just it's not something that's gonna get you all the way into production. And it was scrapped and pretty much tossed in the garbage. So after the 10th Flaming Mo, um, we felt pretty defeated. And when a couple of developers feel defeated, there's only one thing that respectable, respect, respectable developer can do, and that is karaoke. So unfortunately, that was the end of our night. That's the end of that story, but that's not the end of the story for Tractor and, and AngularJS, because uh, I was able to take all of those frustrations, all of those um, things that I've learned over that time, um, and Tractor was born from that. Um, Tractor is a wireframing, prototyping, and design um, framework. Um, it's really just an empty shell that uh, gives you the tools to be able to create these pages in an organized way. Um, it uses Angular um, as more of a templating language. And also, if you're familiar with Angular, and actually I forgot to do this before, um, who is familiar with Angular? Pretty familiar, that's probably why you're here. Um, secondly, who has used Angular, built something with Angular? All right. And how many people have used Angular to prototype HTML web pages? Okay, good, not too many, otherwise this would be way too short. Joke's a lot better at the beginning of the, of the talk. So what we're gonna be using is Angular as a, as a templating language, but also as a way to extend the DOM, because that's what Angular is awesome at, is creating new, um, new tags, new directives that add functionality. So that's what we're gonna be using Angular for. Um, and it, it was created to address a lot of these problems that, that we found, a lot, of the, um, um, a lot of things missing from these frameworks and these other approaches. So that is why we need it. Hopefully that's, a lot of those things resonate with the developers and the designers in the room. Um, I know they did with me, which is why I created this talk. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to dive into, to, into uh, Tractor and talk about how um, the, the tools within Tractor allow us to address these problems that we just talked about. So the first one is we want to be able to write more modular code. Um, if you are, uh, if you get into SAS a lot, it's really about being dry, about breaking things into small functions and not repeating those things over and over and over again. So why aren't we doing that with HTML? Uh, if you're in the Twig talk, that was a, a big push is, you know, let's be dry with our code. Let's not write that thing 10 times because it shows up 10 places. Let's write it once because it's always the same thing used 10 times. So. Um, in our, uh, our code example, you can see on the right-hand side, we have three blocks that are pretty much identical. Uh, some different layout, which is just all CSS driven, but the content in those three blocks is identical. So there's no reason that we want to write that HTML three times because those blocks might show up 50 times throughout our 20 different pages. And when the client comes back and wants one minor tiny little change, you don't want to have to go and find every single instance of that. You want to have one canonical source you can make a change to, and then that will be updated throughout your entire project. So I'm going to show you a little bit of the underneath of, of uh, Tractor in this case and some of the, um, uh, the Angular. Uh, I'm not going to dive too much more into it um, in the other examples, but I just want to kind of show you how this would work. Um, what you'd have is you'd have a partial, this bundle small.html. It's just a standard HTML file with an opening and closing tags at the top and the bottom with code in the middle of it. Um, there's a few more. Actually, no, this one's clean. Never mind. Um, and that code we can just repeat over and over again within our pages. And we do that by using a partial directive. And I talked about one of the powers of Angular is that we can have this type of markup. We don't have to actually have div with some like data dash element equals. I mean, we can really customize the markup to be uh, not quite sort of verbose uh, and really to the point, easy to read and really easy to understand. So we can define our region and we can define partials and what partials go into that region. So if we need to add yet a fifth or six of those blocks, just a matter of adding an additional partial to it. Uh, if we need to add some more, some more stuff inside of it, we can just put another partial in between and we don't have to worry about, did we you know, close a tag, open a tag, delete something we weren't supposed to. So um, uh, yeah, so that's what we're able to use. Oh, there we go, partial. 
this is what the JavaScript looks like in Angular. Um, it's just a directive call. So if you've written uh, any Angular, um, you're just creating directives, which in this case, we are creating a, a directive that uses the E um, restrict, which means that it's an element. It allows you to create elements. You can also do ones that are attributes and classes. But So we can create an element that has functionality. In this case, it's really simple. It just goes out to a folder, grabs an HTML file, and brings it in and renders it. So um, just it's really simple as far as this one goes. Some of the other ones get a lot more complicated, which is why I certainly won't be diving into them. But the code's all there. Uh, relatively well documented. I'm sure it could be better. Um, but this gives you a quick idea. And that was not the right button. All right. Um, of what we're doing is we're using um, Angular directives to be able to bring this functionality to bear. So when the page loads, Angular is going to look at all of the directives you have on the page. It's going to pull in all the partials and create the page for you. So the second thing we want to be able to um, use is the concept of template inheritance. A and again, Fabian stole, stole it from me, or, or actually maybe some, gave you a, a taste of it before this. So it makes even more sense. The idea of template inheritance is that we have these different layouts on our pages. And they're commonly used over and over and over again, but just the content inside of it is going to change. So what we want to be able to do is actually create a template, like so, that has regions in it. We can define those regions. We can define the elements that are used for those regions, whether it's a div, a section, or a nav, or whatever those are. We want to be able to assign classes and IDs and those types of things. And we want those to be consistent from page to page to page. It's just like in a, in a Drupal theme, we're going to have a bunch of different template files. Um, you want to be able to define what those are and use those over and over and again. And the advantage of this is it's going to challenge you, force you to say, like, I need a new template. And so you actually have to create a new template rather than just creating a new page that's oh ever so slightly different. So it allows you to keep track of all your templates. And when you're done with the process, you're like, I've got 10 templates. I need to make sure I make that in the theme. So we um, define the template. We define the regions. And then when, let's see if this is my next. Yes. Um, OK, there are our regions. See, so we just uh, define them with name. And then back in our, um, here we go, back in our home page, we're actually laying out all the content. You can see we have the regions. Oh, OK, I zoomed in. Uh, we have the layout. We described that up top. So we can easily change that from one layout to the next if we need to. Uh, and then we define our regions and define the content that's inside the regions. So again, we can use partials. We can use just straight HTML if it's just like a one-off piece of HTML. But it allows us to use this template inheritance where if you've got 10 different pages that use this one template, and you need to change the order of the primary and secondary within the DOM, you don't need to go to all 10 of the pages and change them and hope that you change them all the same way in every single page. You can go to that template. You can make that change, switch the DOM order, add a class, add an ID, whatever you need to do uh, for all of those templates to then inherit that code. And, and that's really the power of template inheritance. You'll find it in Twig, and it really makes this process a lot better. And I think I just highlight them. There we go. All right. Um, Oh yeah, so just going back to show, so this is the template, those are the regions, the partials and content that you put into that code is just gonna get placed right in there. It's just gonna get substituted in and that'll be your, this is like if your final result code. So all the classes you use, all the IDs you use and those types of things. So the second, or third thing, uh, the third driving principle is that we want to make, we wanna spend less time building UI especially UI that we don't need to build as prototypers. Uh, I, I made a couple examples of that with, say, like navigational menus, tabs. So um, as I said, I was able to, just a week ago or so, I was added into some tabs directives. Uh, Fortress came right from the, the Angular uh, website. They had some really good code example. So I was able to inherit that and bring it in. So as you can see, what we have is we have some more custom directives. We have tabs. We have a pane. So these are really descriptive. They're not super verbose you know, um, data tags or anything like that. You see, we're just describing the title of the tab as tab one, and we're putting content into each of those tabs right there. And what we get is an actual tab. I've put some CSS on here, of course, but it's going to take care of laying out all of the markup. It's going to take care of the JavaScript functionality of changing the classes of not just the content below, but also the class of the tab as well. So it takes care of all that for you. I mean two minutes and you've, you've written your tabs instead of two days. And little things like that you're going to be doing over and over again is certainly a really powerful and time-saving thing. So the next thing that we can do, and this is really handy, especially in the prototyping phase, is we can create placeholders. There's no reason that we need to go into Photoshop and create an image of a certain size, you know, your 200 by 300 pixel image, import that in, get it into the assets, get it into Git, you know, place it in your page and do all those types of things. 
Um, through JavaScript, you can build all these things. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple of the ones that are currently built in um, to, um, to Tractor. And of course, there's, there's tons more you can do. Uh, but the first one, uh, which is really nice, is you can actually create full-on images from code. So instead of having to import or you know, create an image, bring it in your sources directory, um, you can actually say image. Uh, in this case, I did use the image tag because it makes a little more semantic sense. Um, and then ph placeholder image. And then you can describe not only the size of it, but also the text that goes inside of it. Uh, the background color, text color, and I'm sure you could go on from there if you really want to, to do more customizing within JavaScript. But the, what the output of this is not just you know some HTML with stuff moved around. This is actual canvas image. So it's going to stretch, it's going to squish, it's going to behave like an image on a page. And if you need to change the color, change the text, you don't need to go back in Photoshop and export all these assets. So in the prototyping phase, this saves you a lot of time, or at least I hope it's going to save you a lot of time. The other thing you do is placeholder text. Just a real simple addition instead of having to go somewhere and find some lorem ipsum or get that within your IDE, you can actually just have a header that says placeholder words, 10. And that gives me a header one with 10 words. And it's really nice because it's gonna be 10 random words. And this is a really nice thing when you have a design that's like, that header is perfect. <laughs> Until that header has three more words and now it's two lines and now it's not perfect. So this is completely random, and uh, I mean, you'll get 10 words every time, but the word lengths are going to be different always. So you'll have smaller headers and longer headers. Every page refresh, you're going to have a slightly different content on your page, which helps for just kind of seeing how this is going to look as things change. Um, secondly, you could have a paragraph that has a certain number of sentences, and that would give you a paragraph with three sentences. Um, lastly, you can also do or you can actually do numbers of paragraphs. So just building out your content on the pages is very simple. Changing the content on those pages is very simple. Uh, and this is just one example of being able to spend less time doing some of these manual tasks and letting Angular do those tasks for you. Yeah, two paragraphs. All right. So the fourth one, using a single style code base from wireframing to prototyping to theming. Uh, this isn't specifically as much like angular javascript this is really more just uh, within the approach that angular allows you to do um, what we really want to do is we want to create one style system that's going to work here and is also going to translate into a drupal theme um, i actually did get a chance to do this on a recent project where we had a theme it was built up moved it over and the process was there's there's always going to be some work to be done but we want the process to be as smooth as possible um, if you are designing modularly in your SAS as well, you're probably going to have a file structure kind of like this. It's broken up into base and components, uh, into globals and layouts, separating your layouts from your actual styles. Um, doing this is going to allow you to attach those styles to the, the actual Drupal site a whole lot easier. Um, you also might have, if you're using extends, uh, I use extends pretty extensively. So instead of actually putting the styles directly onto the selector, I have like an H1 styled up as an extendable. And then anytime I need to use that, I can just extend it from that class. So what you end up having is on the left. This is like my little bundle small. I'm going to you know, extend the white box. And then on my H3, I'm going to extend my title. Now, of course, that's not going to be the markup that we're going to actually have in the Drupal instance. We're going to have some long, crazy little view thing that's built by Drupal, and it's going to be different. But it's the exact same styles, the exact same extends, and the selectors just need to be changed. It's the same content. It's the same styles. You just change your selectors, and you'll be able to attach all those style behaviors to your new design. Um, when I went through this process, it worked pretty well. There's always going to be a little bit of work, but it's going to be a lot less work than trying to design a completely new system. So that's one of the things we want to do is be able to create the system that starts at the prototyping and designing phase and actually will roll directly into your actual uh, Drupal install. So the last thing we want to be able to do is work in teams more efficiently. Uh, we don't want to have that instance where the designer designs and designs the designs in a silo and gets done and then passes it off to the front-end developer and the front-end developer crafts his pants because it's, ah, uh, <laughs> it happens too often. So by doing this, we can get the, um, we can get the developers, uh, the front-end developers into the process a lot earlier. Um, I'm trying to remember where, oh, yes, okay. Uh, so one of the advantages of using something like Tractor over, um, over whether it was um, Jekyll in the first place or uh, a Ruby gem called Serve in the second place is this is just HTML and JavaScript. The entire thing that you need to run this entire system is HTML and JavaScript. You don't need a server. You don't need, comp you don't need compiling. 
it will run on anything. You can throw it up on a shared hosting and you'll be able to view it. You can make changes and those changes will be viewed. So there's really nothing necessary other than that. So the barrier of entry is small. There's no downloading you know, command line tools and Apple this and 500 meg patches of that. You can just start using it. Um, but, oh okay, yeah, no, no compiling. But it also comes with Grunt server built in. So if you're familiar with Grunt, Grunt is a task manager, and it's a very awesome task manager. Um, and with a simple NPM install, after you get stuff in, other stuff installed, uh, you'll have a Grunt server that allows you to spin up the server, um, compile your JavaScript, live reload, all those types of things as well. So for the power users that want to do that versus using like CodeKit or something like that, that's built in as well. And again, we can build in even more things in the future if we need to. So yes, a simple NPM install and Grunt server for the win, you're up and running. Or again, you can just toss it in front of MAMP, you can throw it up on a server, and it works. There's no compilation process, um, and it makes it nice and simple. Um, so obviously, in that case, it works great with version control. Um, you can even go into Git and make changes in Git, or like to the GH pages or something, if, you're, if you have it in there. And those changes would be live, no compiling, nothing else necessary. Um, have you ever tried putting a Photoshop file in GitHub? Not a very good process. So what this allows us to do is get that front-end developer in early. The front end developer is going to be involved in taking your, uh, uh, taking your, um, say, your, all of your content types and all those deliverables and actually creating that initial markup. Uh, the designer is going to be able to start designing. And as that goes, the, the front end developer can continue to be involved, um, refactoring where things can be refactored, giving suggestions on maybe different ways to approach something that's going to be more efficient down the road or easier. Uh, and in the end, you should have a, pro a, pro a product that is better and also a process that is faster because once you get that to the point where the design is signed off, the front end developer's job is almost done rather than just starting. So the hope is we can make this process faster, we can make everyone happier in the process, and we can start designing in the browser a lot easier than we did before. Um, yeah, that's basically just what I said there. So there are a couple of bonus wins as well for any backend developers that happen to accidentally stumble into the room. Um, when, we, um, when we create things we get for free, when we create these manifests, what we're also doing is we're describing um, different pages. We're describing all the content that is going on to these pages. So as a backend developer starts building all these views, all these blocks, all of these nodes, they know exactly what that content is going to be pretty early in the process. They know the order of it and like the, you know, do you want a div tag or do you want a paragraph tag? Some of those decisions can at least be hinted at the beginning that allows the developer to start that much earlier. Um, oh, down. There we go. Um, and also, um, it provides that list as well. So if you're using panels, if you're using um, um, context, I, I did, had, had like kind of an aha experience where I was looking at uh, the context list for a particular page, and the context list read exactly like the page manifest. Like, add that block, and then the view, and then this, and then that. And so that context, all, the, all of the, the nodes and everything that was going in the context, was exactly like that manifest. So you're able to get some of these things set up um, beforehand and set in place that allows the backend developers to start building that data out um, a little bit earlier and a little bit more defined. So those are the bonus wins and our takeaways is we need testers. I need people to use this product. I need to find out what's working and what's not working. What's, what are stumbling blocks? What are things that would make it better? Um, I would also love to have um, some uh, have contributors. Um, I am not an um, AngularJS expert. I really hope that's not what you're expecting when you came to the room. Um, I've used it to do some cool stuff. Um, a lot of the work that is in um, uh, Tractor has actually come from some other contributors that I know of. They've done especially some of the heavy lifting. So if you do have a pension for it and you've got some great ideas, I would love to get some pull requests coming in or at least some ideas into there. Um, and what we really need to also be talking about is what are other ways that we can get developers and designers working together. Um, uh, another small epiphany I had a couple weeks ago is that I really want to consider changing my job title from front-end developer to more of a front-end architect because I'm really no longer writing CSS. I'm no longer saying, okay, I want this button to be orange. So background equals orange. Um, that is the designer's job. So what's my, what, what is my job now? My job is to take those styles and create systems from them, systems that can be reused, systems that are efficient. It's not really a developer anymore. It's really more like an architect. So what are other ways that we can get front developers involved to make this process even more valuable? 
Um, and again, do as much as possible before we get into that theme. Do as much as possible while code is cheap and while changes are cheap. All right. And that is the end of my presentation. Thank you. <laughs> 41 minutes. Great. Um, and it looks like we're pretty good for time, right? Good, like 15 minutes or so? So uh, do we have any questions? We'd be more than happy to take some. Yes. Use the mic. <laughs> right, there's a microphone. Use it. Or that yeah. one. So um, <laughs> a thing I, I saw here is, by the way, I'm doing kind of the same system to us, Justin Clear um, jQuery, and that was mm -hmm. horrible. So <laughs> I'm really looking forward to this. No, but, so you begin to build all these classes. You're beginning to build all these things, and you kind of want to change the markup because you have to move that stuff into Drupal. Wouldn't it be wonderful in Drupal 8 if we didn't have to do that, if we have decided on the classes and the whole architecture? <laughs> I think this is the first time in the world. Okay, I think so that is. Write that down. Okay, so um, the thing is, if you saw what these wonderful young men did, was having a bunch of classes that, Flag. oh, I have to move them into Drupal. Now I have to change them. Wouldn't it be a wonderful thing if we didn't have to do that, if we already could decide of all these classes as we want them? You're just pushing twig, aren't you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm, I'm pushing the twig lag. That we're going to have a discussion in about two hours, 2.14, where we're going to talk about these things. And I want to have you all there because we need front-end developers to take charge on this. Else it's just going to be me and probably you. Hopefully. Well, so. hopefully not just me. <laughs> that was, ju that was just my steal on my plug, sorry for that. Yeah, uh, on that, like Twig, from the, from the talk yesterday on Twig, that is certainly where we're going to be going. When Drupal 8 is solid, um, I could see this, you do this entire process, and you've already built your theme without even needing Drupal to be bootstrapped at all. You can build your content types and little JSON arrays and pop them on in, and you can start building out your views in Twig files because it's the exact same process. <laughs> um, I think Vector also might be done. I just the <laughs> we can just move the microphone. It's wireless. Yeah, because I can't hear that well either. I think, <laughs> yes, I think this is also work. I, I just booked a meeting with the senior PM to tell him we'll be using Tractor for this. But <laughs> you said one thing that, that like made me twitch. You had, like on your left-hand side, you had the CSS for your prototype. Mm -hmm. On your right-hand side, you had your selectors for your Drupal site. Yes. I just want to be saying, if you started out using an object-oriented approach for your CSS, you wouldn't need to change it for the final site. You would just inject those classes into your Drupal site. And that depends on the approach that you want to take. I, I typically go from those extending those extendables with a selector that's there. Um, and I don't like changing classes in Drupal, mostly, because <laughs> I'm more of a front-end developer and not as much of, uh, of a Drupal developer. Um, it, yeah, depending on, the, on your approach, I agree. If you're more of an OO approach where you create classes that you apply, that's perfect. Um, our approach is just slightly different, but you get the same result in that you get to build. What's important is building the styles. It's, it's what does that H1 look like? What does that button, what does that box look like? And once that's built, you don't have to build it again. You might have to change selectors, you might need to add selectors, whatever that process is, but you've already built it. So you don't need to go through that process over again. So once you're designing the browser, you hopefully should be able to take those styles and move directly into Triple with those. Uh, any other questions? Besides, when can we start? Awesome. Cool. Well, I appreciate everyone coming uh, as my first talk. The fact that people are standing out there and still standing out there. Um, I love you all. <laughs>